This talk is uh, about a startup's data journey um, and the growing need for orchestration as we, uh, as we you know, um, advance on this journey at a startup. There's been a lot of talks out there about like how, you know, big companies do big data using big data infrastructure with big data infra teams. Uh, this is the opposite story of a nimble startup that started with just, uh, you know, me and my garage and my garage three years ago. Now we're about 75 people. But this is a story of building um, some data infrastructure, data platform using uh, what people label as the modern data stack nowadays and how we started basically from scratch uh, being a data native company, right? We always had uh, data in mind from day, day zero, the company and how uh, we build our infrastructure. So I'm going to get started on that. Um, I feel like at Airflow, Summit, at, at Airflow Summit, I don't need to give too much of an intro, but I've been doing data for a long time. Um, I started Apache Airflow at Airbnb in 2014. So shout out and hello to the folks in uh, in San Francisco at the Airbnb offices. Um, I definitely left a, a piece of my heart there at Airbnb. It was such a good time, uh, 2014 to 17. Um, so hello to the folks there physically today and then people who are uh, have are, are now like everywhere in other places in the world. Um, I also started Apache Superset while I was at Airbnb. A um, little bit of context on Apache Superset. So uh, Apache Superset is a data visualization, exploration, dashboarding platform. It's very much a competitor to things like you know Tableau and Looker. And, um, and then more recently, uh, about three years ago, I started Preset. Uh, which is very much, you know, offers uh, managed superset as a service. So if you haven't checked out um, Apache superset in a while, we've been, uh, the project has been accelerating quite a bit and getting so much better so fast. Uh, so if you've never checked it out or, or if you'd like to, if it's been a while, it's definitely uh, a good thing to, to see like where it's at now. And I would encourage you to do that on preset where it's really easy to, you know, you can get it, get it up and running in a minute and uh, play with data um, in no time. So now talking about this journey. So getting into the the, the topic of my talk here, um, the, the intent is very much to tell how we built our data platform, our data infrastructure from scratch or really it's not that much from scratch using like the, the 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 ingredients from the modern data stack and how um we we grew from being um from not having even a data team and doing data on the side to um to having pretty good uh, data platform today so a little bit about preset too so i think like since we're telling the tale of the the data journey of preset it makes sense to give a little bit context on that. So I already mentioned a few things about preset, but uh, we're the visualization layer for the modern data stack. Uh, the startup is about three years old. Uh, we're a series B company, $50 million raise, about 75 employees at this time. And uh, we're very much like a, uh, a SaaS company. So software as a service, um, you know, doing product led growth. So, so we really put our product forward. We do freemium, bottoms up, self-serve, and we're super, super data driven. And then there's this term data native that I'm trying to coin. I'm not sure if it's been used in the past, but people have been calling uh, companies, you know, digital natives or cloud native uh, companies like, you know, Airbnb, for instance, is a cloud native company that always was on the AWS since uh, day zero, at least I believe that's the case. In our case, you know, I said we're data native in the sense that from day zero, we had data, data infrastructure, uh, product analytic, analytics in mind from, uh, from the very, very beginning. Um, so talking about the journey uh, and how it started, so the, the phase the phase zero is like when you start a company, you know, you go and purchase a bunch of like SaaS uh, product offerings. So you pick a CRM system, you pick an applicant tracking system like Lever, um, you slap Google Analytics on your website, um, and then you get some stuff like right out of the box, right? So these things are uh, kind of great because like you, instead of starting from nothing and starting from scratch and having to build a bunch of things, like the systems that you acquire, they provide some form of data. And then by definition, they are data silos, right? Because like HubSpot has information about your, your customers and Lever has information about recruiting. 
on your website as visit, but all these things don't come together until you bring, you know, something like a data warehouse or until you start really uh, doing a little bit of data engineering. So we had this stuff kind of out of the box um, in, in, in the early days of the company. Similarly, we started to, to build our product. Um, we had to have some sort of operational analytics for the product we're building. So as we build infrastructure to run superset at scale, at preset, uh, we set up Datadog and there's some some ways, you know, by proxy that we get product analytics or some sort of information that is not pure logs or pure, you know, memory and CPU. So uh, so we had some information in that way, you know, that that is like pre beta pre launch, but we still had some information through um, operational analytics that we get for free. That's very ephemeral, right? You typically have a few weeks worth of data. It's not really intended for business intelligence type use cases. And um, it's limited to uh, to the internal systems. So, um, so that was the early days. Um, then, so we went, we did our beta launch, I preset about a year and a half ago. Um, and there was no way that we were gonna launch without having product analytics. So uh, with our beta, we started welcoming, um, you know, having a private beta where we would invite prospects and customers to, uh, to try our product. And then from that time on is when we really started to think about product analytics. And the first thing that we needed to wire up is uh, the analytics events, right? So, um, so Superset, uh, you know, in, in our case, we're not starting a product from scratch. We're building infrastructure that runs Superset in a multi-tenant type environment at scale. So, uh, but the, one of the first thing that we did is wiring the analytics events that existed already in Superset. And instead of pushing those to the analytics database that comes with Superset, um, we decided to rewire these analytics events and send them to something called Segment. So Segment is a software as a service. I'm not sure if I'm going to do a good job at explaining what it does, but for me, it's a little bit like a managed Kafka service. Um, it is a transport layer, so you can log data. So they, they offer APIs and clients where you can log data um, to using their clients, and then the data will accumulate in this transport layer uh, you know, where you can kind of monitor things and then they will lend the data periodically. Um, I think it's a transport layer. So that means you can, you can send it to different places and integrate with different, um, sinks and targets. But in our case, our goal is just to log data and send it to BigQuery, uh, which is the data warehouse that we set up, uh, for ourselves. So something that's really su surprising there is like setting up segments, setting up BigQuery. It's pretty easy nowadays, right? Like you can, um, you can just kind of sign up for an account, sometimes a free account and get things going pretty, pretty quickly. Um, then we had to do scrapes. So a lot of people, I'm sure there's a lot of data engineers um, watching this and often like the two main source of product analytics are analytics events that are emitted actively by the product and then scrapes that are, you know, you go and um, dump the data, the data that's in the database periodically. Usually, usually with things like change data capture um, or things that allow you to do data sync. Um, in our case, the way that we build multi-tenancy inside our multi-tenant superset cluster, um, you know, the way we build it is we have one virtual database for each superset workspace or for each customer, essentially, and for each freemium customer, everyone has their own virtual database. So we had to build our, our kind of our own scraper here that would go and look at what has changed since the last run and it, it dumps the data uh, in a kind of custom way. So it sends the data uh, more directly into BigQuery. So normally you would have been able to do that pretty easily with something like Fivetran or other um, services that can sync data where you, you point to a database and it will just take your OLTP database and then um, synchronize it to the, the target or the data warehouse of your choice. In our case, that's BigQuery. Uh, but in our case here, we, we built our own thing. Um, I preset we also built a control plane. So we build a piece of software that's managing multiple clusters of superset instances. So we have superset clusters running in multiple region and we have this control plane that manages everything. So there we kind of copied the patterns of analytics events and scrapes um, with this control plane. And then we, with all this data right now, we have like tons of events and tons of um, referential information in, in the form of scrapes. We need to start you know, transforming this data so we can uh, go from super raw ingredients to um, engagement and growth type analytics. And that we did with um, SQL and uh, using DBT to run these um, these SQL scripts. 
I'll talk more a little bit about um, DBT um, in a few slides. So here, after I would say product product analytics, like we really care about customer data. So we uh, we use uh, a HubSpot for our CRM, and it has all of our information about our prospects, customers, um, people who attend our, our webinars, and all these things. So we have tons of our information that's super valuable in HubSpot. Um, we also have the product analytics, and we want for these things to kind of um, merge together. So um, what we do, what we set up there is. Fivetran, you know, synchronizes the data from HubSpot into BigQuery, and then it's possible for us to ship some product analytics back to HubSpot using HighTouch. So HighTouch is a reverse ETL tool um, that can also be set, you know, in minutes. Pretty easy to sign up for an account. Uh, your first connection is free, so it's pretty easy to just set this up and say, like, hey, I want to send back information about how uh, different companies are using our product maybe one was their last visits what's their mau count so this allows us so, so the reason that we we send our product analytics information back to hubspot is that we can use that there to manage our email campaigns and and segmentation so hubspot can use these custom data properties that you send from your data warehouse to uh, to do all sorts of fancy things workflow automation and email sending and task generation so Pretty cool stuff, and um, overall, like not not that hard to set up. Like these things, that you fire up these services, you connect them together, you say which fields you want to go. You do a mapping of fields, and then things happen um, pretty magically. Then we have marketing data. Uh, so first, we have our website traffic. So our website is written with something called Gatsby. Uh, there's a Gatsby plugin. So Gatsby is kind of a, a static site generator framework thing. So we built our marketing website with it. It's pretty easy to send that data again to Segment and into BigQuery. And the beauty of using Segment across the board is that uh, we have we have the same fingerprints, kind of the same like cookie um, tracker for people across the board. So that means we can actually do funnels that will. Uh, so in theory, we can see like, okay, this person clicked on an ad maybe, or they did this search in Google, then they found preset, then maybe they what they 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 consume some of the, some of our blogs. Uh, and then they click on that try for free. So we're able to uh, to track the funnels and the conversion because we use the same logging mechanism across the board. Um, so here, nothing too complex too, like also fairly easy to set up. Um, and then just listing out some data sets, some other data sources that we decided to bring into our warehouse over time. And those are less centric to what we do, but we have like internal processes and, and teams and people who are really interested in some of the data um, coming from other systems like GitHub. So uh, so for engineering velocity, uh, community type information, Rickerly is kind of our uh, payment provider uh, for self-service. Uh, so when you got a preset and you sign up and you buy say 25 seats for your team, uh, you do that by swiping your credit cards, uh, your credit card and signing up for a plan. And that's done through Rickerly. There are payment um, and subscription provider and we use something called Pando. Uh, Pando is some sort of like tool that can allow in product guides, in product survey, onboarding form. Um, so this data is good and complementary with the rest of the data. So we also push that in the warehouse. Uh, Spark Post is what we use to send product emails. So if you want to know whether people open and clicked on links on email, if they received it, if they opened it, if they click on links. So that comes from Spark Post. Shortcuts is our Jira-like issue tracker. So tons of information there for our customer success team um, and then Lever for recruiting data. So um, so that kind of paints like everything I talked about so far, um, paints this picture, this high level data flow diagram um, that shows just kind of the systems we have in place at Preset and then how everything converges into big query. Um, maybe I'll use my mouse here, hopefully you can kind of see it, but um so here we have like some of our main data sources so here there's all the complexity around the preset superset go system where we have like multiple regions multiple instances uh we have the, the manager thing the control plane all of that it gets dumped into BigQuery. Uh, as i mentioned like five trend and segment you know um sync the data from a bunch of SaaS services <clears throat> puts, puts that into BigQuery. And then we have Airflow, which I'll, I'll get a little bit more to talk about Airflow and the role orchestration here. But you can you can start seeing here that there's so many systems and things 
uh, that, um, you know, we're starting to be at a point where we don't have a small jazz band anymore playing music, like a quartet. We have like a big band and then we need a little bit of a, an orchestra director and someone that, uh, or, or a tool that can um, keep track of all the stuff and give the cues to the systems to do the right thing. Um, I wanted to talk about DBT a little bit because it plays a, an interesting role, an important role in what we do. Like all the transformation are happening within BigQuery here and are, are orchestrated by DBT. And um, there, there's a lot, there's pros and cons in DBT, and it's it's been great in a lot of ways for us. Um, it's really easy to get started DBT because it's it's simple, stateless, and infraless. So you don't need to have to set up a service. Um, you can kind of just run the little CLI on your uh, on your laptop. I think for the longest time, we just run like dbt run daily, like someone would run it to just process the data for the day. I think like a little bit after we set up a Jenkins job, but um, but it was really easy to set up. It's also like incrementally adoptable. So it makes a lot of sense if you, you have small data sets to just reprocess your whole warehouse. So for us, we can just say like dbt run dash dash full refresh and it will recompute the entire warehouse from scratch. But when you have like, you know, thousands of customers or tens of thousands of users uh, and, you know, millions of events, it's it's pretty cheap um, to, to just recompute everything. It also leads to like not so great um, data engineering practices, right? Like, cause you, you need to go back when data gets bigger to set up your incremental loads. But, uh, you know, I think it's the, the beauty of it is like very lightweight, very easy to get started. Uh, and it is in for less. Um, and it's compatible with Airflow. So we knew that as we would grow, I did some research and then um, there are things that will take your DBT DAG and unpack it inside an Airflow DAG. And then as you do this, then you get a lot more logging information and information around like what's, uh, you know, which jobs took long to run. Uh, and then you're able to weave in more things in your DAG. Maybe you can squeeze in a sensor or squeeze in uh, a Python script or, or an ML like data science type type thing to um, to connect to that, um, to weave that into or to augment your DBT processing. So some of the cons is it's stateless. So, so stateless was a pro too, but it's, I guess, often there's like the flip side of the things. but. Uh, there's kind of no logs, right? And there's there's no information about like who triggered what job when. Um, so that that has been somewhat problematic for us as we scaled. Um, it doesn't necessarily push you to have the functional approach. So maybe some of the people um, here listening um, have been following some of my talks about functional data engineering. So uh, functional data engineering is the general approach of using uh, functional programming practices and applying them to data engineering and um, dbt works more like a compiler than it works like a functional program in a lot of ways so uh, there's 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 pros and cons to that but uh, for for me um like being just a big proponent of, of functional data engineering um and that's been a little bit of an issue it's possible to do in dbt it's just like it's just not the natural or the common approach and there's no sensors so that led to maybe the, the next slide. Uh, so since, you know, DBT will just run like basically you're like compile my data and it will go and compile your data. Um, what, what happened is that we have we had a bunch of systems that were not orchestrated. Right. Um, so five trend dumps data when it feels like it. Um, same with segment. I think it's like we observe that it's loosely every four hours um, our own scrapes grew to take like 10 hours at some point and we paralyzed it and, and we changed it. But like, so all of these, these badge job are lending at a different time. And then when we run um, our processing our data pipeline, we don't really know whether all the data is ready in there. So that's, it ties to the fact that there's no real sensors. So, so, you know, you can run the same process and, you know, you have to ask yourself like, what was the data that was there when it ran? And we have some issues around like early arriving facts and just like not understanding, uh, you know, some outcomes and, you know, what really happened uh, and what it looked like when it ran. Uh, so this I would call cacophony. So as opposed to, you know, the, the analogy with an orchestra director is like the when you have someone orchestrating, then you can have an orchestra and you can have a symphony. Um, here we have the opposite of a symphony, which is um, systems refresh when they want, and then we're not quite sure where we're at in time. 
and uh, we have non-deterministic results from that. It's not necessarily a huge pain, but uh, but it was enough that at some point we we're just like unclear. We're not standing on solid ground in terms of like everything data ops related. So that's when, that's when we decided that, okay, we've waited long enough now and we need to bring in something to make sense of all these systems and coordinate them. Uh, so Airflow as the, the orchestrator for all these things, for orchestrating things like high touch, five trans segment, BigQuery, uh, DBT, uh, even like some caching loading inside superset and preset. Um, and then in our case, we decided to go with Astronomer just as being like a really great managed service uh, by people who contribute very, very heavily to the open source project. So we thought it's the absolute best way to run Airflow. Uh, we're not in the business of like running our own Airflow cluster and we had delayed that for a good reason. So now we just wanted to have like a very well managed system and decided to, to move forward uh, with our friends at Astronomer. Um, so the case for Airflow, I've, I've made these points already, but like staying sane while the data flow complexity grows, um, you know, I'm, I mentioned the greatness of the modern data stack where you can sign up for things like high touch and Fivetran and, and, and preset and uh, DBT cloud, if we want to use that, like all these things are super easy to sign up for, but then they're so easy to sign up for that you end up with, uh, you know, so many systems that need to be orchestrated. So maybe in this new world where you have like data infra as a service and you can pick and choose all the best pieces of infrastructure you want, you need even more orchestration to to stay sane and, and orchestrate all these things. Um, we needed sensors really bad too. Like we we need for DBT run to not run until the scrapes are done, right? Like it's just a waste of time, or we had to have like very complex logic in DBT. That's like oh, depending on what the latest day is start a run and sometimes the latest day might change during the run. So you have a DAG running and then the condition change during that DAG and you have undeterministic results. So we have, we absolutely wanted to avoid that and sensors are so native to Airflow and so useful to data processing that is just a no brainer. Um, logs are great. Like when uh, you have a data apocalypse of some kind, um, you know, you need to be able to stand on something and not guess what was the state of the warehouse at the time where you ran the thing. Um, that's that's pretty problematic. To, if you don't have logs, you kind of have nothing. Um, and I'm not even sure if there, there's like there's some legality issue, not legality issues, but you know, it's it's important to be able to to understand and prove how the data was computed and when and how. Um, growing need for little scripts that glue things together. So we've been able to go pretty pretty far without that, but like every every now and then in data, and, and you know maybe that's more the standard, you need a little Python script that's gonna do something, or you need you know a notebook that's parameterized that's gonna do, uh, perform a very specific task for which there, there, there's no tool out there that you can buy. There's nothing in the modern data stack that does certain things. Maybe you wanna do, data quality checks a certain, a certain way. Maybe you want to stitch, you know, two systems together that are not, you know, um, open source systems, whatever it is, there's always a use case to, um, to, to coordinate things with a general purpose computing. Um, so with, with Airflow, it's pretty easy to just like give it arbitrary scripts and arbitrary workload and weave that into the bigger bag of data processing. Um, and then for us, that will enable us to do uh, to do our first steps into ML and data science. Um, so you know we're starting to to run some A/B tests or, or you know to figure out exactly how we're going to do certain things, and we we want some more predictive analytics here and there. Um, so Airflow is a great place to 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 kind of stitch that together and uh, to have a place where you can run these arbitrary um, uh, and schedule the, these workloads. Oh yeah, we also got a data team recently. So so at Preset, every team's a data team, but um, but all that stuff that I was talking about, like building a lot of this infra this infrastructure I was pointing to was done by people in their spare time. Like the the this um, green square was done by app, app kind of engineer, full stack engineers, backend engineer, infra engineers uh, that stitched together little parts here and there of the system. Uh, you know, people set up things like segment and five trend. I wrote a, a bunch of the the SQL that is you know was executed by DBT. Uh, someone set up high touch. So all these things 
uh, were stitched together with in the absence of a data team. And now that we have data professionals at Preset, we have two. So we have a, our first analytics engineer, data engineer who started earlier this year. And then these people, I think they need to stand on stable ground. They have a little bit more focus and mind share to, uh, to set up something like Airflow and orchestrate things, right? So I think like now we can crank up the rigor, we can give uh, these data professionals, you know, good good foundation to stand on, um, and you know, Airflow is definitely uh, an important part of of that um, keeping our data infrastructure, data pipelines together. Um, here, that was a pointer towards uh, the Unified Data Architecture 2.0, which I think is interesting, and then I put the logo of the things that we picked on top of it. Um, so this, this piece, like just for reference, uh, this um, folks at A16Z, uh, the, the VC firm who did a bunch of analysis on what's in a modern data stack. And they've identified kind of all the swim, the swim lanes and all the cells and some of the leading products in the different area. Um, so this is really, you know, the map of the data, like a modern data infrastructure um, for a large company. So for me, I wanted to overlay here what a smaller company needs, right? Like maybe the, 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 not necessarily the basics, but the foundational stuff. So for us, like we really needed to have a data warehouse. So we picked BigQuery, right? Could have been Snowflake or something else, but we picked BigQuery. Um, we really needed to do data visualization uh, and embedding some dashboard and do things like that. So we did that with SuperSan Preset. Uh, we needed to run a bunch of SQL every day. We did that with DBT. Uh, we needed to like a transport layer where you segment for that. And then we need to send data back to HubSpot. We pick HubSpot. So these are in our case, like the, the, the more fundamental things we need, we can go without a lake house. We can go without a bunch of like complex ML infra. Uh, we can go without stream processing in many cases, at least on the short term. And we can cope without uh, data discovery, like something like Amundsen or the friends at Airbnb, something like a data portal we're okay on the short term, um, you know, without this system, uh, these systems as we grow, I think we're gonna add more logos and coverage on this, uh, on this map. Um, another thing I wanted to share some thoughts about the unbundling of Airflow. So that's a really interesting uh, blog post from the folks at uh, FAL.AI, which uh, are pretty cool. And, you know, if you haven't seen that, if you're kind of interested in the, the Airflow world and uh, you, have, you have not, um, read that post. It's it's kind of interesting. It's the general idea that, you know, originally I think Airflow was just a big orchestrator and a lot of people would write a lot of their own tasks and operators to do the to do the work um, across the data landscape. And then what we're starting to see is in the different areas like data sync and data transformation and uh, reverse ETL, we have some nascent tools that are um, more specialized at doing certain things, right? So that means like what you used to do with like SQL and maybe your Presto SQL operator in Airflow, maybe you do it with DBT. What you used to do with writing your own Python script to scrape your external systems, you just use something like Fivetran. Um, but the point being, I think, you know, as we re replace the custom develop workflow that typically would have been done inside Airflow DAGs, now Airflow really fulfills its function of being an orchestrator, right? So instead of being the place where you manage like a thousand scripts that you've that you've written um, in house, well, now I think Airflow becomes more the orchestrator that triggers external systems that are specialized and can do the work. And I think that's a fine place to be. Um, originally, when I when I started Airflow, the goal was not to use Airflow for heavy data computation workloads or to do to act like you know um, an application that does a lot of work. The the goal was really to orchestrate a bunch of external system to say Hive run this job, Presto do this, um, you know, uh, Superset go and refresh the cache. Right. So the 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 intention was really to orchestrate. But then uh, you know, it's so convenient to have a general purpose computing framework that people were like, oh, I've just got to write a bunch of Python script and orchestrate them. And so I think over time it got bent into that direction, but I think we're going back to um, the, the roots of really of orchestration. And as the, mo the, modern, data scape, uh, the modern data stack landscape grows, 
the more you need something to glue it all together um, and stay sane and stay on top of all these things. So I have some some closing statement and I'm probably at time and uh, I've talked a lot and I'm a little sick today. So, uh, but I would like to take some questions, but before that, a few closing statements. So, um, and I've probably made these points already during my talk. So data native startups have um, access to world-class data infra through modern data stack services. That's amazing. Like you can, um, you know, in our spare time at Preset without having the, a data team and people um, who are really focused on data full time, we're able to do like some really amazing stuff um, with world class infrastructure that rivals the kind of infrastructure uh, that exists in places like Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, and others. Right? You can just go buy these things off the shelf, pay as you go. It doesn't cost anything with you know or nothing significant if you have small data. It's really easy to set up. These things connect and work well together. It's pretty fantastic. Um, yeah, the services are pretty dirt cheap. Um, and, and you know, what used to be hard is easy now. Um, edge cases are also common, right? So there's a bunch of system that do all the common things. You want to synchronize databases. You want to scrape your CRM. Like these things are very um, common sense. And then, you know, you can get services that do these things. There's always an edge case for a script, right? Like there's always something, some systems you got to sync together and there's no five trend integration for it. There's no segment connector for it, maybe because it's a homegrown thing. Uh, and in those cases, Airflow is a great place. It's still, you still need a place where you're going to run these like arbitrary workload that stitch, uh, stitch things together. Um, also like complexity compounds very quickly when it's so easy to sign up for these services and it's so easy to publish work um complexity compounds and then it doesn't take very long before you're really confused about what's going on in your pipelines because you have six systems that depend on each other and run on their own schedule um so yeah as this complexity grows you really have this increasing need for an orchestrator and uh it's it's just been awesome to define not only that you know it's it's pretty easy to set up airflow with something like astronomer where it's you know you can just like get it set up without having to do too much work on like setting it up and maintaining it but then you find all of the operators that exist for all the services that you picked so with with that this is the end of my talk and it was a pleasure talking to you all